Welcome to Family Church. We're glad you're here today. And, you know, this, this is a good place. And, you know, God, God has a plan. And, you know, you, you, you may be here today and you're like, man, this is, I don't know, this church is a little bit different. Well, that's okay. And, you know, we, we, are, we're, we, we want to take the time. We want to be sensitive to what the, the Holy Spirit is doing. And we also want to pray, you know, for those who have heavy needs and, and just believe God for miracles. But we also, you know, we also want to communicate God's word in a way that can change your life right now. And so, you know, this morning, um, you know, I was thinking to myself, I'm like, man, I don't, I don't know how today is going to go. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I can do this or not. And, um, you know, I just really, I really felt the Holy Spirit just squeezing on my heart and, and saying, you know what, you, you don't have to go out there and do this. I'm going to, I'm going to do this and uh, I just need you to show up. And so today I just showed up. Okay. And that's okay. Right. Like that's okay. Sometimes you just show up at church and even when you're the pastor and, and you just let God do the rest and he can and he will. Because he loves us and he has a good plan. He has a solid plan for our lives. And, you know, I know there's a lot of people that are watching online. And, and you know, if you're watching online, we're so glad that you are. And, and I know that uh, these are difficult times. And there's a lot of people right now who, who, who honestly, you probably don't need to be in a large group of people. And, and if you're watching online, we understand that. And we want you to just be safe. And if you're here... We're glad that you're here, and we're trusting that God is going to take care of you and, and that God is going to keep you safe while you are here, and that he is going to speak into your life, and it's going to be good, right? So, so just let me encourage you today to continue to pray for Terry, and we will try to update you as much as possible. Um, they have a daughter who lives in Houston, Texas. She's flying up right now as we speak to try to get here. Her name is Paula, so we need to pray for, um, for her safety as well. But, um, you know, we all, we're all going through different things. And, and today I just happened to be going through something hard, but, but um, it re I'm reminded that every Sunday there's someone that comes through these doors that feels exactly like I do today. And they just need a place of hope, you know, a place to come where they can get strength from God and, and get information from God that, that can help them and, and move them forward and, and not just come and punch their God clock for the week and say, oh, I went to church. Aren't I such a great Christian, you know, uh, but a place to come and hear something that they can information that they can use right then in that crisis to move them forward. So anyway. We're glad you're here, and um, we are, we're going to jump into this today. I, you know, I don't know how this is going to go, but if you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 5, because I am, I am excited to share this with you, and I've been working on it for a long time, and so I, I do want, I do want to share this information with you this morning. Matthew chapter 5, I'm starting a series this morning entitled The Extra Mile, The Extra Mile. And, and as I said earlier, I am, I am beyond excited about this new series. What I'm, what I'm about to share with you is my absolute favorite stuff to teach. And this information is going to help you. And, and really, it has the potential to reshape your spiritual life, your personal growth, your health habits, your career, and all your relationships. And so in every sense of the word, this is transformation information and it's information that you need. And most of what I'm going to share with you, I um, actually have already written into a new book called Pursuing Excellence. And so you're going to hear a little bit more about that as we move through. But we're going to spend the next several weeks here talking about this. And so if you miss a week, maybe just hop over to the website or hop over to the Facebook page, hop over to the church app and you can stay caught up. So today what we're going to do is this. This morning I want to, I want to lay some groundwork. And this series is designed to teach you how to practice biblical excellence. And so this is not going to be self-help. This is going to be self-confrontation. And you're going to hear some things in this series that are going to make you a little bit uncomfortable. 
But um, the goal here is that you can make adjustments in your life so that you can look as much like Jesus as possible. Can we all get behind that? And so, so I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to stretch you. I'm going to push and prod you. I'm going to find the best in you. And I can guarantee you that I'm going to irritate you. As we move through this, you're going to be like, oh man, why is he talking to me, you know? Uh, so I'm going to irritate you a little bit as we, as we go through the information. So, so um, here's what I've been praying over this series. Here's what I've been praying over this series. Number one, I want you to understand that excellence isn't about manipulating God with work ethic. Excellence is preparation with the right heart. And so what's a right heart? A right heart is a heart that is godly. A right heart is a heart that is bent toward heaven. A right heart is a heart that is humble and teachable. So if you prepare, but you don't have the right heart, you cannot practice biblical excellence. Are you with me? And so as much as I want you to be excellent, I want you to have a right heart. And so your heart has got to be a godly heart, a heart that is bent toward heaven and a heart that is teachable. So that's number one. Number two, I want you to learn how to, like Jesus, catch God's eye by creating an environment of going the extra mile. You know, one time heaven opened and God said this about Jesus. God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And you know what? I want God to be pleased with you. How many of you want God to be pleased with you? So if heaven opened and God spoke about you, what would he say? This is my beloved daughter. She's kind of okay-ish. <laughs> this is my beloved son. He has his days. Is that what God would say about you? If the heaven opened and God said something about you, what would God say about you? God said about Jesus, this is my son. And I'm pleased with him. And so when we think about excellence, we think about creating an environment like Jesus did that catches God's eye. And Jesus did that by going the extra mile. And we're going to talk about what that means in just a moment when we read the scriptures. So that's number two. Number three, I want you to clearly see why you sometimes never rise to the level you've been praying for and I want to give you the tools that you need so that you can rise to that level. So let me ask you a question this morning. Are you currently praying for something that you truthfully haven't prepared for? Because I've been in that boat before. I have been in situations where I was praying for something and asking God for something that I was not currently prepared for or even really doing anything about. And, and I will share this. Listen, as I get into this information, I want you to know that I know what I'm talking about here. And even this week, um, you may have seen something, some of this on my social media, but this week I landed a new book deal. And um, the title of my new book is called Unshakable, Overcoming Worry, Anxiety, and Emotional Despair. How many of you think you might could use that book? Okay, ushers write down all these hands because they're going to buy one. <laughs> and I said that for a reason. Yes, I prayed that I would sell that book to a publisher. I prayed hard that I would. But in the meantime, I've been working on that book for four years. I rewrote that book five times. I changed the title twice. And now I've got to rewrite it again all before November 1st. So I have five weeks to write this book. I'm a little stressed. Usually it takes two years from the time I start a book until it's on the shelf, but they thought this book was really needed and so they want it in bookstores in 10 months. And so uh, for the next five weeks, I might need a little extra grace. And I said that for a reason. Because, because you have to make sure that you're doing what you need to do so that God can do what only God can do. Because preparation with excellence is the starting place for a successful outcome. Guys, listen, excellence is the environment of heaven. And when we recreate that on the earth, then we have the confidence to ask anything in his name. 
And I just think that that's so important. You know, I, I could boldly go to the throne of God in full confidence because I had prepared with excellence. So if you're asking God for a new car, but it's been 20,000 miles since you changed the oil on your old car, I don't have much confidence in that prayer. If you're asking God for a big ministry, but you won't do small behind the scenes ministry, I don't have much confidence in that prayer. If you say you would die for your faith, but you don't come to church when it rains, (laughs) you understand what I'm saying? And so, listen, preparation with excellence is the starting place for a successful outcome, no matter what it is. And so, I want to start with three scriptures this morning. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 41. I'm going to read it and I'm going to explain it. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 41, this is Jesus speaking here. And he says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. That's really important because under Roman law, a Roman soldier could ask a Jewish man to carry his backpack. And the Jewish man was obligated by the law to carry that backpack one mile. It was expected. So if I'm a Roman soldier and John, you're a Jewish man, I could come to you and say, look, I have a five mile hike and you're going to carry my backpack for the first mile and you as a Jewish man would have to say yes sir and pick up that backpack and start walking and so here in these verses Jesus was teaching his followers to go the extra mile by carrying the backpack two miles most people would have carried that pack for a mile thrown it down kick some dirt on it And say, here you go, I have fulfilled my obligation. I am not carrying this stupid backpack another mile. Well, listen, can you imagine the look on the Roman soldier's face when a follower of Jesus kept right on walking for another mile without complaining? You see, folks, that's the difference discipleship makes. There is a clear distinction between us and everybody else. Disciples don't look like the world. Disciples don't act like the world. Disciples don't talk like the world. Disciples don't live like the world. Listen, we should be better employees. We should be better athletes. We should be better at marriage. We should be better at parenting. We should stand out in every arena of life. And when someone says, will you go one mile? Our reply should be, we'll go too. We'll go too. I'm not just going to do what's expected. I'm not just going to do the one mile that the law says that I have to do, but I'm going, I'm going to go, I'm going to go the extra mile. Jesus lived an extra mile life and he wanted his followers to do the same. And there's so many valuable truths here that we're going to get into this morning. But before we do that, let's go ahead and look at Daniel chapter six, because I want to read these verses Daniel chapter 6 and verse 3, it says, Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Now, there's a lot going on here, but, but when I read this verse, I'm reminded that you can be preferred over those around you. Daniel was. You can be preferred over those around you. Just like Daniel caught the eye of the king, you can catch the eye of your boss. You can catch the eye of a potential spouse. You can catch the eye of a new friend. And you know what? You can even catch the eye of God. And as you read the story of Daniel, you find out that Daniel was literally thrown to the lions. And yet he maintained an excellent spirit. Listen, a person of excellence does not need the right environment to do the right thing. 
See, some people have to have the right environment to do the right thing. They have to be around the right people. They have to be in the right place. Everything has to just be so-so for them to do the right thing. And yet here in the story of Daniel, Daniel was literally thrown to the lions, and yet he continued to do the right thing. Why? Because that's what a person of excellence does. They're the same no matter where they are or who they're with or what they're doing. Let's read one more verse, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23. It says this, whatever you do, work at it with what? All your heart as working for your boss. Is that what it says? As working for who? The Lord, not human masters. Whoa, we're going to talk a whole lot about that more in about two or three weeks. But when I read that verse, what I see there is that every job is worthy of your best effort, even the stuff you don't like. Because you're not doing it for a human boss. You're doing it like you were doing it for the Lord. So if your job is cleaning toilets, then you clean those toilets like they're the Lord's toilets. If your job is mowing grass, you mow the grass like it's the Lord's grass. If your job is teaching kids, then you teach those kids like they're the Lord's kids. So everything that we do, no matter what it is, man, how many of you have ever had some disgusting jobs? Okay, yeah. I was a dairy farmer for six years. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. I'll, I'll spare you all, the, all the, the grossness of that. But you know what? I always, I always looked at, at every job that I'm doing like, like I'm not doing it for a boss, but that I'm doing it for God. That this is not, I'm not working for people. I'm, work, I'm working for God. And that's exactly what the, that verse in Colossians chapter 3 teaches us. Now, let's move on. We're going to go back to that probably next week, but I do want to share this with you today because I feel like it's really important. Let's talk about the power of extra. The power of extra. At 211 degrees, water is just hot. At 211 degrees, water is just hot. At 212 degrees, water begins to become steam. And with steam, you can power a locomotive. Raising the temperature of water by one degree is the difference between something that is simply very hot and something that generates enough force to power an entire train. At 211 degrees, a train just sits powerless on the track. But if you take the temperature up just one extra degree, not only will it begin to move, once it's going, it's nearly impossible to stop. So, hypothetically, what would happen if you raised the temperature of everything that you're currently doing by one degree? What would happen if you, if you raised the temperature of your marriage by one degree? What would happen if you raised the temperature of your work ethic by one degree? What would happen if you raised the temperature of your spiritual life by one degree? What would happen if you raised the temperature of your worship by one degree? What would happen if you raised the temperature of the way you parent by one degree? What would happen if you changed the temperature of, the, of your eating habits by one degree? What would happen if you changed your teachability by one degree? What would happen if you changed your willingness to get along with others by one degree? I said all that for a reason. Some of the things that you are about to give up on because they're just sitting there more than likely only need a little bit more effort from you, maybe only one degree. You follow me? Water is just hot water at 211 degrees. But at 212 degrees, it's steam and it can run a train. And it only has to come up by one. Man, that, that's some real revelation to me. 
It's just that little bit of extra. It's the power of extra that we're talking about. Remember, it was Jesus who said, when you are expected to go one mile, go two. And so let's try, let's try a little experiment this week. Every time you use the word can't, this week, I want you to replace it with the word won't. And that's going to tell you whether or not you're an extra degree person. So here's what that looks like. Instead of saying, I can't be patient, tell the truth and say, I won't be patient. Instead of saying, I can't be on time, tell the truth and say, I won't be on time. Instead of saying, I can't get along with others, say, we know, James. <laughs> we had a meeting. Instead of saying, I can't eat healthier and exercise, say what? I like cheesecake. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> doesn't, that, doesn't that change it a little bit? I mean, that tells you whether or not you're an extra mile person. Just doing one small thing, being a one extra degree person, can make a tremendous difference in your life. Let's read this verse, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. 1 Timothy chapter, ver chapter 4 and verse 10 says, That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. I love that. that. He says, that is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God. Listen, God has called us to labor and strive, not just to be our best, but to do our best in everything that we get involved in. God wants you to do your best in everything that you get involved in. I think that for a lot of us, we wait we wait until our lives get out of balance and then we start to do the extra that we should have been doing all along. And what happens is we get frustrated and we decide to quit because it seems like it's impossible to get the train moving, but we forget that we can get the train moving with just one extra degree. That we can turn, we can turn hot water into steam just by one degree, just by one, doing one little thing, we can get, we can get the train moving. Okay, so now, number two. The next thing I want to talk about today is this. To succeed, you need commitment, not objective. And this is super important. If you have your Bible, turn to Proverbs chapter 13. <clears throat> to succeed, you need commitment, not objective. Proverbs 16 and verse 3 says this. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Another translation that I read said, commit to the Lord whatever you do and you will succeed. How many of you want to succeed? Yeah, I do too. And so according to Solomon, the way that we succeed is that we have to commit whatever we do to the Lord. And here's why. Commitment keeps you going when it's not easy or convenient. And I think we miss out on some of the opportunities that God has already prearranged for us because we value objective over commitment. Now, let's talk about this for a minute. What, what is your objective right now? Just be honest with yourself. What is your objective right now? For some of you, it's like, I just want to get through college before I murder somebody. I have few college students in my house in my family and in my house right now for some of you it's like what's my my object I just want to be the best mom that I can what's your object I, you know I want to you know I want to uh, um, I want to land a specific job or or maybe I just want to be in a good in a good marriage or maybe I just you know I want to get rid of some of the stress and some of the things in my life that are that are weighing me down what what's your objective right now I always said that I wanted to be the oldest man to ever win an Ironman. And so the good news is I don't have to start training until I'm 70. Because <laughs> the guy was like 78. So I got some time, right? So that's my objective right now, Scott, okay? 
And so whatever, what, think about it. What is, what is your objective right now? Now, let me ask you, are you focused on that objective or are you focused on the commitment that it will take to get there? So is the objective, are you all about the objective? This is what I want and God, this is what you've got to do or I can't be happy living here on this earth. Is that where you're at? Are you thinking about the objective or are you thinking about the commitment that is, it is going to take for you to get there. One of the stories from the New, New Testament that has always intrigued me is the story of the rich young ruler. And as I was reading that this week, I really you know, saw some things in here that I want to share with you because in this story, we see the difference between commitment and objective. And we still mess it up all the time, so let's look at it. It's found in Luke chapter 18. So in Luke chapter 18 and verse 18, Jesus has a conversation with um, someone who is kind of thinking about following him. And, and it goes like this. In Luke chapter 18 and verse 18, it says, A certain ruler asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He basically says, How do I get saved? Like, how do I become a Christian? How do I make myself ready to go to heaven? And Jesus goes on and he says, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. And you shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. Now look at verse 21. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. I want to stop right there. This is a list of objectives. So the rich young ruler says, I've got the objectives down. I have kept them from the time I was a boy. I honor my mom and dad. I don't lie about people. I don't steal. He's like, man, I have got all these. I, 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 Jesus, I'm good with the objectives. I have got all the objectives down. But Jesus is about to flip the script on him. And he's going to start talking to this guy about commitment. And so in verse 22, look what Jesus says. When Jesus heard this, he, he said to him, look what, you still lack one thing. He had all the objectives down. He knew, he knew where he wanted to go and what he wanted to do. But Jesus said, You're not, you don't get it yet. You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. And I want you to notice that Jesus said the same thing to him that he said to the other 12 disciples. He said to him, come and follow me. But the rich young ruler ha had a, a hard time understanding what Jesus was saying. The rich young ruler had no problem with the objectives. He had no problem with keeping the rules. He had no problem with keeping the commandments. It was the commitment part that he struggled with. And if you look at that story, money wasn't the problem here. The problem was that money mattered more to him than Jesus. He had a commitment issue. And in your life, listen, it's not the objectives that are going to get you to where you want to be, although it's good to have goals. What will get you there is the commitment that it's going to take to put you in that place. Are you with me? And so you have to do more than just concentrate on the objective. You have to apply that commitment factor to your, to your life. And listen, it's time for us to follow the teachings of our master by no longer only doing what is required or expected. And so if the coach says, run one lap, run two. All you, all you athletes are like, oh no. <laughs> if it's date night with your spouse, turn up the heat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, okay, we know where James's mind's at today. Okay. That means you turn up the heat, James. Right? Okay. <laughs> when you're at work, doing what no one else sees, do it like everyone else sees. You, you getting this? 
It's the extra. It's the thing that Jesus said that people don't do. If you're asked to go one mile, go two. Why? Because nobody's doing that. If you're going to be my follower, then there's going to have to be a difference between you and everybody else. It's so, so important that we get this. So number three, this is the last one. In closing, take action with commitment. Okay, this is, this is going to be really important. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9 says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You ever get tired of doing the right thing? You ever get tired of doing stuff that no one else sees you doing? You ever get tired of doing what you don't want to be doing because there are other things that you wish you could be doing? Anybody, else, anybody out there like that? Yeah, me too. And we get weary. It's not that it's bad things that we're doing, it's good things. And the scripture says we get weary when we're doing good things just because it's not the things that we want to be doing. And sometimes you will see the benefits of your extra effort right away and sometimes it takes a while. Think about it like this. If you're growing dandelions, you can do that in a couple of days. But if you're growing oak trees, that's going to take a few years. And I can tell you that I have never sat in the shade of a dandelion. <laughs> I know I'm a small guy, but, you know, I just had to beat James to that, okay? Has anyone here ever, ever sat in the shade of a dandelion? Has anyone here ever sat in the shade of an oak tree? So you can grow something like a dandelion in a couple of days. But if you're going to grow an oak tree, it's going to take years to do it. And you can't get weary in well-doing. You can't go out there every day and say to the oak tree, Why don't you just grow already? It's been five years. You're not even five feet tall. No, you have to give the oak tree time to grow. You, you, can't, you can't be weary in well-doing. You have to just keep going. Listen, guys, the enemy is always working to get you to become weary in well-doing. He doesn't want you to be a 212-degree follower of Jesus. He wants your life to always feel short of your goals. And he wants you to give up before you ever get there, but you can't. And I know some of you are so tired of doing what you're doing. But if you're doing it with the right heart, you got to keep doing it until you get to where you want to be. You're sick and tired of getting up and going to that job every day that you hate. But if you get up and you go to that job every day that you hate with the right heart, God will eventually provide a job for you that you love getting up and going to. But you have to just keep going. You can't get weary in well-doing because the Bible says that in due season you will reap. And you know what? If the Bible says it, then we can take that to the bank. Thomas Edison said, many of life's failures are men who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. <laughs> I remember right before, and I, again, I, you know, we, we, we can only share what we know and what we've been through, but you know, I, re I remember right before um, I wrote the, the Holder books for, just, for race hunting. And um, <clears throat> I told Karen, I said, I'm, like, I'm, I'm, I'm done writing. I, I, I'm, I'm not good at it. I don't, I, I'm not enjoying it. I don't want to do it anymore. And, and it's just nothing was making sense as I was looking at it on, on paper. And I said, I'm not even going to submit this stuff because I, I know that it's not going anywhere. And she looked at it and said, you know what, I think this is good. I think you need to send it in. And I sent it in, and long story short, you guys have seen those, you guys have seen those books, and many of you have read them. And I gotta tell you, I was, I was this close to just throwing that stuff in the trash. You've got to keep going, even when you don't feel like it's good. 
Even when you don't feel like that, you want to. Even when it's hard, even when it's difficult, you have got to keep going. Why? Because doing a little more makes life feel like a lot more. At 33 degrees, water falling from the sky on a Saturday is a gray, rainy day. At 32 degrees, children are building snowmen, riding sleds, and promising their parents that they are warm enough to stay outside for just five minutes longer. The difference is one degree. That's it. One degree. One degree. It's like, oh, this is the crappiest Saturday ever. It's 33 degrees. It's pouring down rain. Everybody's sad. Everybody's sitting on the couch. 32 degrees. Big white flakes falling from the sky. Everybody's jumping around celebrating, right, Tammy? Everybody's jumping around celebrating. We got snow. We're outside. We're sledding. We're having snowball fights. We're, we're building snowmen. What's the difference? One degree. A single degree is the difference between the gloom of, win of winter and the fun of winter. That's it. You may just be one degree from the gloom of life to the fun of life, but you've got to start doing it. Doing a little more makes life feel like a lot more. Jesus said it. Jesus said, always go the extra mile. Did you know that making one extra, more, if you make one extra mortgage payment a year, you can turn a 30-year mortgage into a 22-year mortgage? Some of you are like, that's the best thing I've heard ever. <laughs> but I mean, it's true. You make one extra mortgage payment a year, and for eight years, you can pay off your house early. Isn't that right, Kevin? It's true. You're the financial peace guy. You better know that it's true. <laughs> One extra mortgage payment pays off your house eight years sooner. Why? It's just the power of extra. So I want to spend about the next six weeks teaching you about the power of extra. And I hope that you'll come. Because it could change your life. And for some of you, the extra thing that you need to do right now is you need to add Jesus to the mix. Because you're out here running around trying to find happiness, trying to find a good life, trying to find all the, make all the puzzle pieces fit together, but you're missing, you're missing the one piece that matters most. And that's having a relationship with Christ. Okay, we're going to stop right there. Let's all stand. Man, I don't, I don't know about you, <clears throat> but I want to I be, be an extra mile person. How about you? Someone says, man, that Larry, if you ask him to carry your, back, your backpack one mile, he'll carry it too, and he'll whistle the whole time. <laughs> he'll, he'll have a good attitude about it. He'll have a good heart about it. He, he's not going to complain about it. I want to be, be an extra mile person. Because Jesus taught that that's, that's the path. That's the path to the life that we all want to live. So let's, first of all, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you today that we have such a great example in Jesus, our master. That he did go, you talk about going the extra mile. He went the extra mile for us when he died for us on the cross. Nobody else has ever gone that far for me I've got some good friends. I, I, I've had people who've done some great things for me in my 47 years on this planet, but I've never had anyone be that extra that would, that would die in my place. That is truly, that is truly the most a person can give. And so Lord, I'm just thankful that I have such a wonderful example in a Savior that didn't just sit back, but stepped up and he stepped up for me and I'm so thankful for that today and I just I'm grateful Lord that that you're in control of my life and you can get me to where I can't get on my own but Lord I also know that um, I need to partner with you in that and I pray you'd help me to do it in Jesus name amen I want the prayer team to go ahead and come forward this morning and you know <clears throat> last last week we were talking about um, John 3.16 and 
We got those cool shirts that said, I am whosoever, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And we talked about who is whosoever, that's us, that's all of us that are here, like we are that whosoever. And, and, and maybe you're here this morning and, and you, maybe you've come into this place and you don't have a relationship with Christ. And maybe you don't even understand why people do. And you know what? I've been in that same situation as you. And it's hard to understand how people can just completely surrender their lives to something that they've never seen and that is completely by faith. And until you've done that, I don't know that it's possible to understand that. But I can tell you this morning that if you don't have Christ in your life, he wants to be a part of your life. He desperately wants to be a part of your life. He is, he is for sure that extra starting place. You know, he's that jump start that gets you on the right foot, gets you moving forward. You know, we talked about the extra mile marriage or the extra mile parenting or the extra mile job or, you know, whatever. Well, that, that begins, that all begins with the relationship to Christ. That's where that starts. And so here at Family Church, we don't, we've, we don't ever ask people to bow their heads and close their eyes when it comes time to surrender our, our hearts or our lives to Christ because this should matter to you. You know, if we can't come and find Christ here in a church full of people who love us and have most of whom have already found Christ, it's gonna be really hard for us to make it for Christ once we go outside. And so Jesus said, if, you know, he said, if you, if you deny me before men, I'll, you know, I'll deny you before my father. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. And so if you're here today and you're ready to confess Jesus as your Lord and savior, because right now you really don't have a relationship with him, would you do something really brave and just lift up your hand? You don't have a relationship with Christ, but you want to have a relationship with Christ. Do you do something really brave? Take that first step and just lift up your hand. That's the easiest thing you're going to be asked to do all day, I promise. God wants to make such a difference in you, but he's not going to force himself on you. He loves you and he will be a part of your life if you want him to be. Anyone very quickly this morning. All right, we're gonna sing this last song and if you need prayer for any reason, we would love to pray for you today and, and um, just trust God for whatever situation that you're in. But before we do that, <clears throat> one more time, I wanna, I wanna just say a prayer over you and just so that you're not distracted, if you would, go ahead and close your eyes and bow your head. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit what he is saying to you today about the message that you just heard. So we talked about, you know, the power of extra. We talked about just taking life up one degree. Like if you just elevated the temperature of your marriage by one or your parenting by one or your work ethic by one or your worship by one, or your spiritual life by one, whatever, you know, you guys heard the teaching. So just ask the Holy Spirit what like, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me, personally, to me, about this teaching? Where do I need to, where do I need to elevate my life? Where do I need to, to, to go from being a 211 degree follower to being a 212 degree follower? Where does the water stop being hot and start turning to steam? Okay, so Lord, we just take a minute here today and we ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to us about this message? What are you saying to us about going the extra mile, carrying the backpack a mile further than expected? What are you saying to us about maintaining an excellent spirit even when we're thrown into the den of lions? What are you saying to us about whatever we find our hands find to do, we do it as unto the Lord and not as unto men? 
Holy Spirit, what are you saying to us about those, those little simple areas of our lives where we need to turn it up, where we need to raise the temperature? What are you saying to us? Just speak. Help us to hear. Help us to know your voice. We ask today in Jesus' name.